Hi, and welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Ben Stover, and I am joined by... Brittany Brownfield, child therapist. Hannah Espinoza, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors who practice out of Chicago, and even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. And today, we are going to be doing The Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> and we are joined by Anthony Sitko from Capes on the Couch. Anthony, if you want to introduce yourself for everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Sitko. Thank you, Ben, uh, Hannah, and Brittany for having me on the show. It's, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, welcome. It's a good opportunity to come back to the show, I should say. Uh, this is my second guest appearance. The last time, uh, my co-host, Doc Issues, and I did The Incredible Hulk, and now this time we're going to be talking about my favorite movie ever, uh, the Empire Strikes Back. So thank you so much for having me, even though when it comes to the therapeutic part of it, I am not even remotely in the same league as the three of you. Oh. That's all right, though. You are for sure a mental health advocate and an ally, and we're happy to have yes. you. And I also think it's good to have another Star Wars expert on the scene besides our sweet, sweet Benjamin. I will say that I've probably seen this movie <laughs> more times than any of you, and I'm even including Ben in that. Oh. Ooh, ch challenge accepted. Yeah, I can. I, <laughs> I for, for my bona fides, just so you, just I've so you this, know, yeah. I the oh. the <laughs> soundtrack to this movie is one of my Desert Island CDs to the point that I can listen to any track in the score and tell you what is happening on screen without any other visual cues. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is how committed to memory I have the score. <laughs> And my high school yearbook quote was, was from Meet this Joe movie Black. <laughs> as well. My high school yearbook quote was, uh, difficult to see, always in motion is the future. Oh. That's outstanding, Anthony. You know, maybe we need to get you into the Legion, sir. You know, it's a lot of time and money. Uh, I give nothing but respect to the people in the 501st, but it's something I, I, I don't know. I just had a kid, like literally last month, so... Um, so it's it's a little difficult yeah, for me. Thank you, thank you. So it's a little difficult for me to find time to do anything that isn't involving cleaning up vomit or shit on myself. <laughs> <laughs> to say nothing of the baby, that's just me. <laughs> I'm just pissing shit everywhere. Oh my god, what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> right, you clean myself first or the baby? I don't even I know. Don't even and know. listen, if you need to, if you need, is to it cry, like the airplane? <laughs> Bask first. Uh, and if you need to cry talking about this movie and just get some feelings out, I, I fully support you. This is a safe space. Appreciate we it. We want to have for you, Anthony. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for today's episode, we're going to be discussing The Empire Strikes Back, which may not be my favorite movie ever, but is by far the best Star Wars ever. Uh, I don't think that's anything that can be contested. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Hannah's already going to be at odds with me today. Let's just start that right now. Um, but the, in the, the classic story of The Empire Strikes Back, the Rebels have established a base on the ice planet Hoth, for those of you that don't know. The Empire finds them, and they have to evacuate. Luke goes off on his own mission, separating from Han, Leia, Chewie, and C-3PO, and goes to find Master Yoda. And at that point, Luke starts his Jedi training. Han and Leia go on off their own adventure. Han gets caught by the bounty hunter Boba Fett. His best friend in the world, Lando, betrays him. And then we learn later in the movie that Luke, spoiler alert, is the son of Darth Vader. I'm glad you gave that brief summary because I feel like I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> The movie is coming up on its 40th anniversary, but, you know, not everybody has seen it recently, so I figured we could give them a quick rundown. It was literally on TBS yeah, this mean, morning. Yeah. Was it really? I watched yes. it on. The TBS app, the TBS app y'all, has all the Star Wars movies on it, excluding Last Jedi, but even, like, Force Awakens and stuff is all on there, in the, like, horrible ones with, like, uh, Hayden Christensen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, those Apologies. are bad. Apologies. True fans um, have the Blu-ray complete saga. So that's what I figured. <laughs> me and you, Anthony. Me and you are on the same team right now. I still have them on yeah. VHS. You know, I just went to my parents' house and I found we have both the special edition and the original ones on VHS. I don't have the original. I do have the special editions. 
And then I have them all on DVD, including the original unedited version of the original trilogy. I also have the Empire nice. Strikes Back on audio tape. That's awesome. That's awesome. Featuring John Lithgow some... as the voice of Yoda. Is he really? Yes. Aww. That's I fantastic. Love him. So we've got some serious Star Wars nerd cred established here between me and Anthony. Um, yes. Hannah has ruined hers already. Even though she's wearing a, a Star Wars shirt today, yes. she. You have something you'd like to say? <laughs> Many things. You can finish that thought if you need to. I don't think we need to start this uh, in the beginning. I think we should just give you your moment. And then... <laughs> <laughs> I will and say, I assume I had seen this movie before yesterday because it's in my brain somewhere. But if I had watched it, I probably had to have been like nine because I did not recall a single moment. that I had. That wasn't something iconic that you just see in like the ether of like, mainstream media like him in the swamp where he's like carrying it on his back and all that business like i definitely had familiar moments like the carbonite and i love you i know but like honestly i was like have i seen this movie (laughs) i was watching it yesterday (laughs) so you've got two people who are coming from as like casual fans and then two people who are intense fans i think that's fair yeah (laughs) Which I think maybe Agreed. will give us an interesting balanced episode. Or you two will just talk a lot and me and Hannah will just be here. <laughs> Which is also okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable having, like, audio high fives with Anthony the entire day. So we're, we're good on that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so but I think that would get a little boring for the rest of the people. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about what our agenda is going to be today. So uh, we've kind of given you an intro. So we're going to cover kind of the... Uh, balance of relationships in this film so we're going to talk about kind of luke and yoda and kind of how mentoring and teachership relationships are shown uh han and leia and their relationship and how despite it being iconic with i love you i know it's uh Trash. Ac- according to our relationship it's therapist not here not so good uh and then talking about lando and lando and dealing with himself and having to betray his friend and luke and vader dope <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's start off with talking about Luke and Yoda. Well, I thought he was adorable. <laughs> Final thoughts. <laughs> I really Good thought, bringing. I don't know where you're going to take it, Ben, but I think what I took from it is um, I really liked, well, I was trying to decide if I thought that Yoda was doing a lot of grounding techniques with Luke in that swamp, question mark? Um Like, having him do a lot of physical work to take him out of his mind, you know what I mean? Like, distracting him to clear his head by, like, bouncing on his hands or, like, climbing rope things with, like, him on his back. Like, I thought it was all really interesting because it's stuff that we do in therapy, which is, like, using intense physical, sometimes, well, sometimes intense physical exercise or experiences to distract you and get you out of, like, your abstract anxiety or to get you out of like your troublesome thoughts that aren't serving you i think those are great insights mm-hmm. um so, coming coming go oh, okay i'll, I'll go, let, ahead, I'll, go ahead. no i was gonna say coming from the obviously the perspective of not a therapist but just someone who has seen the movies what i appreciated was the fact that yoda understood where luke was and he he didn't force him early, particularly I want to I want to bring it and focus particularly on the on the issue with the cave where he points out to Luke, you bring in there only what you take with you. And he he doesn't want Luke to even go there because he's basically trying to say to Luke, you're not ready for that yet. Certainly not with bringing weaponry and any uh, of of the additional stuff. Luke, of course, being the headstrong jerk that he is, doesn't. Uh, want to listen to that so he says well i'm just going to bring my weapons in anyway and then of course we know what happens but i i really appreciated that yoda kind of took luke and worked with him where he was and didn't try and force him into too much too soon yeah i think it's a good observation i also when you're saying with the weapon thing that is an interesting insight like i don't know maybe wanting him to I don't know, be more emotional and mental versus coming at it in this aggressive way. Like the way we talked about in other podcasts where we have a tendency to use anger and like the violence that comes with anger usually 
to kind of mask our other deeper feelings. And I wonder if that was kind of like a way for Yoda to try to subvert that and get them to go deeper and not be stuck in like violence. Well, I'd be very curious to. Yeah, I'd be very curious to see how the encounter would have come about had Luke said, you know what, I won't bring the weapons in with me and just walked in. I don't think he maybe would have encountered Vader Mm. like that the way that he did in the cave, or if he did, it certainly would have come out in a very different uh, situation where he wouldn't have had the the big lightsaber battle. I don't know, because obviously we didn't see that in the movie, but I'm very curious to see how that would have played out had he not strapped on the belt with the the blaster and the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely would have been interesting to see that, like what he would have had to face and deal with. And I think one of the things that you point out, Anthony is that <clears throat> there are that meeting people where they are is so important and it's actually something that we really practice a lot in um, as therapists is that that's one of the most important things you can do and most uh, helpful things you can do for someone is really meeting them where they are and not having any any expectation or any kind of motivation of the the things that you think they should be doing or the things that they need to start working on. Like sometimes you really just meet people where they are. And especially with Luke and Yoda, I think that had Yoda come in any harder or in a different place, how much different this movie would have been. Because I would imagine that Luke would just get annoyed and leave. Like, or maybe he'd pump up Luke too much if he came at him from like, you are the last hope and like all that hunk of junk. Like if he came at him with all his expectations... There is but he's not one. the last hope yeah. because there is I another. Which looked was... that up on Wikipedia. After <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to figure out if that was something that they already knew that. There well, was do you, be, if it was Leia like, or Ray, but yeah. now we're sidetracking. Yeah, but I think you bring up a good point, Hannah. Where Yoda does a good job to, like therapists do, where you ask questions sometimes of your client and you already know the answer like most of the time when I ask a client a question I kind of already know what the answer is but it's so much more powerful when it comes from them versus when I'm just like telling them and like data dumping on them and then they can so easily like disregard it or not listen and so when you like make them think for themselves and come up with the answer themselves it's so much more powerful and I feel like Yoda is trying to do that kind of with Luke which is make him come to his own thoughts and conclusions and well, rule number one of being a lawyer is never ask never ask a question <laughs> to which you don't already know the answer. So Yoda would have made a fantastic attorney. Which we should point out, we didn't mention this time, that Anthony is an attorney. So that's probably key information here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Forgot to mention that. Sorry. Because it, it wasn't pertinent to my Star Wars bona fides. <laughs> <laughs> but Yoda does the thing that he like he does. He's like a Columbo energy where it's like, oh. What's happening over? Why don't you explain to me what you think's going on? And that's how you get people's guards down as well. And then they come to you with all their information, right? And the difference of of not acting like the expert, mm-hmm. and sometimes letting as a mentor or as a teacher, letting them explain things to you in the way that they understand them, which I think we do a lot with clients because sometimes it feels like maybe they're not understanding, and it's like, wait, why don't you tell me what you heard me say? Or what's important from what you said that they take from it and then being like, oh, okay. Because either that can be really great or you can be like, oh, no, I have a whole thing happening in their head based on what they thought I said. And then you can, like, learn from that and grow from that, which I'm sure Yoda's doing. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing for me in this mentoring relationship is that it didn't start from a place of trust right away, which I thought was an interesting thing. And as a mentor someone that supervises people i find somewhat of an issue with because yoda didn't represent who he was right away he let luke believe that he was just this person who could take him to yoda and was testing him the entire time which well, luke that's how those jedi miserably. do that's what we talk about in last jedi jedis are kind of sneaky and they kind of don't give everyone all the information and keep a lot of secrets and how that causes schisms and problems the same way that it causes problems in families. Keeping secrets is a really big barrier to people feeling more connected to each other. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. And I find that it it set Luke off. Like, he, he was already, like, showing his clear Anakin-ness and not having patience and not being able to recognize that he needed to slow down and show respect to everyone if he's going to follow this path and be a Jedi. But he doesn't have the slightest 
concept of what that means. He's still a little bit of the insolent teenager we saw who wanted to pick up some power converters at the Tashi station. Exactly. Is Luke supposed to be likable in this movie? (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was struggling with, to be honest. I mean, I don't think so. I think, like, this is... We're showing Luke go through his, like early adolescence and transformation into adulthood if he didn't if he started out as the likable person he becomes in return of the jedi then he would have not had a journey to go on okay or or it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful i think that's one of the things that he has to go through he has to start off or he has to be broken down so that he can be built back up um, and I think that's certainly uh, sidetracking a little bit. That's one of the things that Lucas tried to do with Anakin in the prequel trilogy was show that he was being broken down, except he rebuilt himself in a very different way, not to derail the subject into the rest of the Star Wars movies. But well, Ben Solo as well. And that's what led to Kylo Ren. Like, it's a very tricky, it's a very tricky technique to try to use with a mentee. Or an apprentice, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Which is interesting, though, is that that uh, teardown approach is the same one that our military uses, and I imagine that uh, is done to some degree with law enforcement as well, and is that we look at, they need to reshape your mind so that you think like everyone else. You all think the same way, you all process information the same way, which is the information that, or in the order of information that we want you to perceive it and how you process how you calculate information is all done the way the army needs you to do it and the jedi being a larger organization would need to operate on the same approach where they can all operate at an intrinsic level of trust with each other that we're all going to make the same decisions the same way and what's interesting about luke is that we don't see the military training that he gets to be part of the rebellion. But we do know that he starts out, he just is given this X-Wing to fly, and then we've got a couple years gone by, and Luke has reached the rank of commander, which a commander in any other branch of the military is a major. So that's a pretty high rank. Uh, So Luke has reached the point where he is gone through some sort of leadership training, so he's had to become this person who's in charge of other people and has to take a point of leadership and now he has to take himself down to become the student and yoda finds a way to break him down by first showing him how wrong he is which is a difficult place for a student to accept but also very impactful i mean it's hard to be humble in those situations and i think that's a big barrier to a lot of stuff i mean what we see a lot in therapy like as therapists like in working with colleagues and stuff is You have to maintain a humbleness in order to continue to learn so that you don't get so egotistical that you make wrong decisions with clients in session. And so there definitely has to be a humbleness there that it does seem like, yeah, Luke is lacking. But also if we're thinking of him as so young, uh, adolescents always think they know everything. It's really hard for adolescents to be humble. (laughs) Well, I think Luke is probably 21 at this point, I don't remember how many years are in between. I think it's three. close to three. Mm-hmm. So he was 19, so he's 22. Okay. He's 22. and um, I'm sure it's on Wikipedia if you look at somewhere. Where Luke is mentally. Think about what he's coming from. Luke just left a planet and blew up the Death Star. He left this desolate desert planet where he was just a farmer and then became the hero of the rebellion that destroyed the Death Star. Think about the notoriety he would have gained from that and yeah, where I'm he sure would he be. he was a huge dick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it went to his head. How could it not? I guess is what I mean. Because he was already looking to be someone big, like something bigger. And then he found it. And not only did he find it, he like became number one OG and then like then raised up in the ranks of the army nonsensically it seems. And then it would be really difficult going into with the Yoda relationship for him to go back to that student space. And it makes sense then why when he goes in the cave, he like does whatever he wants or like brings weapons because why not? Why would he not do that? Yeah. He hadn't yet unlearned what he had learned. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) So we kind of talked a little bit about where Luke is and some of uh, Yoda's 
uh, methods that are questionable, what did we see that was beneficial? Because Yoda is almost the gold standard of mentor relationships in films that we've seen. So what do you think is the things that, what do you think of the things he did right? Well, I think Hannah and I kind of like, you know, he asks a lot of questions. He comes from a place of, I always tell people, I will, I give this advice to parents when they work with their kids. So they're not like lecturing is like, come at it from a place of curiosity, ask a lot of open-ended questions, come at it from a place of like whimsy, almost like, why don't you help me understand where you're coming from? And like I said, like all those techniques he uses, which kind of could be seen as to break Luke physically. I honestly thought of him as like, almost like, well, very intense, but grounding techniques, which I thought were really good. Yeah, I agree with those statements. I think Yoda's ability to show Luke that coming from a place of mindfulness and groundedness and patience can lead you to much better results than just going with your first instinct and operating at anger and how dangerous it is to operate that way where you're loose and out of control. Even though you've done well instinctually, it's important to look about how do you take where your strengths are and open yourself to the teaching of someone else, humble yourself and also slow down and do things deliberately. Learn why. Well, yeah, because I think that he's operating out of survival mode. So when we do that, we don't have any, it's really hard to have awareness about all different kinds of things. And so I think that one thing, and especially with what we know about the force is that you have to be able to, be really mindful and really pay attention to that and be able to have a lot of awareness of your thoughts and feelings and how you act upon those. And so I think one of the reasons why he is teaching him all that stuff is because he's going to be fucked if he can't do that stuff. He won't be able to use the, the force properly because he'll use it out of anger. I think I, I, I agree with that. And I think one of the most important lessons that he teaches him is when the X-Wing falls in the swamp and he gives Luke the opportunity to do it first. And he says, no, it's it's no different. You know, yes, obviously the X-Wing is larger than a pebble, but the the core concepts are are exactly the same. It's just how you apply them. And he gives Luke every available opportunity. And it isn't until Luke basically gives up because, again, he is that impetuous young my, young person. And Yoda finally says, OK, if this is what it's going to take for you to believe it, then I'll show you. And, and Luke, I don't believe it. And that's why you fail. And I think that's one of the key turning points for Luke as well, is Yoda gives him that ability to be able to say, I believe in something more than just what's directly in front of me. You know, Luke had the prior experience with the Force and this and that, even from, from Obi-Wan in, uh, in A New Hope. But it's, it's really here that he learns how to fully put his faith in the Force, in something bigger than himself, and aspire to be something more than just what's immediate or, or dealing with what's immediately in front of him. And I think that's probably the best lesson that Yoda taught him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think those are all great points in, like, getting out of the ego, I think seems like a big part of it, like you said, kind of, yeah, getting out of your own way. So something that I want to kind of pose to us, I mean, we can kind of discuss as a group here, is Yoda knows that Luke is almost the last hope. We know that there is another, and that we, we don't know who it is yet, but we learn later that it's Leia, and Yoda knows that, but why do we think that Yoda doesn't stop Luke from going to face Vader. Is it the thing where they think they have to learn, he has to learn his own lesson? You think that's what it is? I think I so. Because it's, I think it's that thing where sometimes you have to let your kids fail and have natural consequences and then they learn from that, even though it's hard, it can be hard to watch as the person who loves them. Well, the risk of losing Luke to the Emperor and to Vader. Well, because they got a, they got a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point that o that that Force Ghost Obi Wan brings up as you know that boy was our last hope. No, there is another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I'm going to go for nerd moment here. But we learn in uh, from a certain point of view that Yoda had always hoped to train Leia. Oh, I like that feminist viewpoint. Well, look at where Leia is at versus Luke. Luke was raised as a farmer. He's impulsive. He's like young Anakin was. He's got the hero thing to him, but he's also reckless, as Yoda points out he's multiple times. Dick. 
Leia, by the age of 19, is a senator. She has the equivalent of, like, a galactic doctorate, and she is... And she's commanding those guys in Empire Strikes Back, and they all respect the shit out of her. Like, she's, like, bam, like, There's boss no lady. There's no man in that group who is second-guessing her, or, like, why would we do that? Except for Han. Blah, 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 blah. Well, whatever. Because <laughs> Han's a fucking... <laughs> we'll talk about him later. Um, but I do think that it. a part of me makes me wonder if... Yoda's was just like blind l- luck. I don't know because it seems very dangerous to put Luke back in that position, especially because Luke is so vulnerable in learning some new things about himself and is also clearly going back into survival mode, right? Where he's like, I have to save Leia and I have to save Han and I'm just going to do whatever the fuck I need to to do that. So I don't know. It feels pretty fucking reckless as a mentor to to do that to somebody who is literally just beginning to learn the tenets of being more aware and more mindful. But and how do you? Th- but how do you think they could have stopped him? Could they have stopped him? I mean, this would be pure speculation. I would imagine that Yoda could probably have used the Force to prevent the X Wing from starting. If he can pull it out of a swamp, yeah, I imagine he true. can keep it. That's what I was thinking. From going Ground anywhere. Him. But would that have done damage to Luke's ability to learn from him? I think that may have been the situation where Yoda understood as risky as it was, he had to let Luke go because if he tried to force Luke to stay, Luke would have shut down and he wouldn't have bothered to listen any to any of Luke's uh, to any of Yoda's future lessons because he would have said, well, you stopped me from saving my friend. So now I don't give a shit what else you have to say. You know, it's, it's yeah, especially if like Luke and Leia when... died. I mean, Han and Leia died. I could see that. Exactly. Exactly. Parents know. And I know this from when I was a teenager, my parents had to let me do the stupid shit. So I figured it out myself because if they had stopped me, that would have just really steeled my resolve. And now I'm just going to show you, I'm going to do whatever the fuck it is I want. You can't tell me no. So Yoda is the permissive parent and says, okay, go ahead. Whereas Obi-Wan in that situation, even as a force ghost, is more of the stay, stay. You know, Yoda gives him the warnings. You know, if you if you honor what they fight for, then stay and and let, potentially let them die, knowing full well that Luke won't. But at least he gives him a bit of an out there. So I think it's a sort of a good parent, bad parent type situation with Yoda and and Obi Wan towards Luke. And ultimately, Luke says, "I'm just going to do whatever it is that I want." And Yoda says, "Okay, then you have to suffer the consequences." I agree with that. I think the other thing, like when discussing this, like as someone who has supervised people, is that sometimes even as a supervisor, you know that someone may not be ready for the situation they're about to get themselves into. However, if they never face the situation, they will never learn how to deal with it and how to both embrace the failures of learning or the you know, the learning from failure and also what it feels like to be put into a situation you can't handle so that you learn to recognize it. I don't think Luke has faced a situation he couldn't handle yet, including getting shot down because he then finds his zip cord and then goes, uses his lightsaber and bombs and blows up an ATAT, which we can see is clearly like a nearly invulnerable galactic tank. And Luke has figured out ways to handle Vader over and over. And facing Vader is the one opportunity that Yoda as a teacher is ever going to get for Luke to find a way to recognize and face failure. Well, he almost died in that snow. If Han and that weird Raptor thing he rode didn't come find him and like get him though. He almost died then. Tauntaun. I feel like he's always been rescued. (laughs) (laughs) And I think, and I do, I do agree with you guys. In that the idea that he would have stopped him could have definitely made an impact. But there's this other part of me that is like there are certain fuck-ups that you let your kids do, right, as a teenager. Like you let them make some decisions. But sending him to the worst person in the world, Mm -hmm. universe, whatever, second worst, sending him to go see him as his like first test just seems harsh. But I get it. <laughs> I understand that maybe he couldn't have stopped him. But I also feel like Yoda would have been able to talk to him about, look, if you leave now, there are things that you need to know in order to be successful. 
you can go tomorrow. Let me teach some more things. Like, even just to get a little bit more time. Like, because the other part of this is that Han and Leia and everybody else, they're not helpless people. Like, they can figure their shit out. And also, Han fucking rescues Luke all the time anyway. So it doesn't make sense. (laughs) So, I I don't know. (laughs) It's hard to make that decision or to figure out, you know, because I think part of what you guys are saying is right. I don't know if he would have actually stopped him or tried to force him in some way. I don't think that that would have gone well. But there's another part of me that feels like if Yoda is supposed to be fucking a Yoda and like know everything, then he should have been able to find a way as a mentor to be like, hey, look, we need to talk about this. Like this is these are some reasons why you need to stay. This is what if Yoda had told Luke that Vader was his father? I don't know if he believed him. I think he was a year a liar and then pout and like, I don't know, run off. I don't know. I don't think I've ever considered that, honestly. I like, was wondering- my mind just like went Thanks, Anthony. You're welcome. <laughs> I was wondering I've pondered it. I pondered it a couple of times. What if had would Luke have stayed had Yoda said, you know, your father Vader is. <laughs> Face him you will. I don't know if Luke I don't know if Luke would have listened. He's such a hothead. I wonder why he didn't tell him to. Because Jedi's it's... trade in secrets. I know. Ugh. They collect them like little dolls. Yeah, it's <laughs> not good. It's not good. Well, he got he got mad at at Obi Wan, Force Ghost Obi Wan, in Return of the Jedi for. And if you rec- even in Empire Strikes Back, when he's recuperating on the Millennium Falcon, he says, "Ben, why didn't you tell me?" He's not mad at Yoda. He's mad at Ben. Yeah, because they have a relationship. I don't know, man. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. It's a tough one. I, I agree. I don't think that I don't think Luke would have processed it the same way as from Vader telling him. And of course, it wouldn't have had the big, classic cinematic moment that, you know, one of the most iconic moments in film ever, which somehow Mark Hamill kept secret from everyone for like eighteen months. Mm. Nobody knew that. I mean, they didn't even let David Prowse know, and he was the one inside the Vader suit. That's intense. Yeah, <laughs> it was. A, it was a very close. He just regard had to, to make. Secret. He just had to make that motion with his hand, like reaching out, but didn't know what James Earl Jones was going to say. <laughs> oh damn! Exactly. He literally didn't know. The only ones who knew were Mark Hamill, Lucas I, uh, Kirshner, and uh, and and James Earl Jones. It shows you the value of secrecy there. Okay, I think that there's probably more we could talk about with Yoda, but I'll save some for the the final thoughts because I think that there's more that we can kind of cover in that section. But let's move on to Han and Leia. Everyone is like, in the Star Wars community, always looks at this as like the great love. And for some reason, the Star Wars community doesn't seem to understand love because everyone wants there to be a Raylo. <laughs> and they look at Han and Leia as an example of this great romance. And well, Raylo yeah, is a terrible this. romance. And so I'll tell you Han this Leia. right here. Yeah. Watching the way Han and Leia interact, I was like, okay, now I really understand why Ben Solo turned out the way he is. <laughs> because exactly. they are not... I mean, I don't know what they're like. Here, well, here's my first question. It's been three years. I did not realize that when I watched Star Wars movie, so I looked it up on Wikipedia. But are they... Have they been in a relationship? Or have they just been dancing around each other for three years? Dancing around each other. For three full years. What a bunch of babies. Dancing, and the way yeah. they're doing this, like, back and forth, like, they owe each other something, but no one's talking about their feelings. And then he's, like, doing a lot of, like, your highness and sweetheart, like, he's coming from a real infori- inferiority complex. And she's just, like, you're acting like a dick. And he's, like, yeah, but, like, huh, don't you like me, though? And she's, like, why would I? And it's, like, I, it just, like, it didn't feel sexy. It didn't feel flirty. It felt very contentious and kind of mean and just is, does not a good relationship make. Toxic. I didn't like it at all. And I love, I love Harrison Ford. Love, love young Harrison Ford. Ford. And I love Carrie Fisher. And I, in my brain, too, I remember thinking of them as, like, such a romantic couple. And this is the movie that has the scene with the I love you and I know. And I was just like, I'm not interested in these two gigantic babies and the fact that they can get their shit together and act like adults and have an adult conversation. This is like teenagers. They act like teenagers. 
And I feel like I remember something similar, like like soft lighting and like how it was like romantic. And no, it is. It's fucking trash. <laughs> he the way that Han Han is like a bro douchebag who like gets his fucking feelings hurt in two seconds. But but he never is clear about why he gets his feelings hurt because he expects her to do something without being clear about what it is he wants her to do. And he also doesn't say anything that seems like is true. All everything he says is dripping with sarcasm. Like nothing seems he's never vulnerable. He's never open. She kisses her brother <laughs> to get back at him. I mean, which we know that she doesn't know that blah, 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 blah. But also it was intense to watch the kissing farce. <laughs> <laughs> but like the fact that she was also playing into that and that they kind of just have this tit for tat kind of relationship is really upsetting. And again, like I wasn't hoping for them to be together after watching this. I was like, I really hope that you two can just be friends or like at least act like grown ups with each other because the way that they treat each other are such a so many red flags of what a toxic relationship would be like where you're never really sure what's going to happen you're never really sure if they actually love you you're not really sure if you need to be true to them like because you don't know if you're really in a relationship and also i'm just fucking sucks well i think what i what is leia well because there's a moment later when there was on lando's planet castle and bespin sure and han kisses her forehead and they have this very sweet moment that's when i was like have they been dating like i feel like when i was watching movies like i don't understand what the relationship is and then she's like and then they get to this place where they're so sweet to each other but i'm like and she's like this is you can say on her face like this is good this is a good relationship and i'm just like the fact that they both accept this like sharp 180 of how they are together and that like there's an understanding that this is how they behave and it doesn't mean that they're not don't like each other it's like part of their cat and mouse thing but then they can relax into being sweet when they both want to oh it just really like bumped me out so i think that there's there's an aspect of both of these things in here of where there's good relationship and bad relationship and there's a there's a point in time where it turns like, when they have their moment on the Falcon where, like, Han's trying to clean her hands, like, he's being creepy and, like, not really respecting, like, uh, her boundaries. Yeah. For consent. For consent. He definitely is not looking for consent. He's so... He talks down to her so hard. Yeah. Like, she's a respected, like, commander or, whatever, or general already. Senator. I don't know. Senator. In this fleet, she's commanding all these men, and he keeps calling her, like, princess and shit. Sweetheart. Oh, I mean, she is a princess, but... But he still, but not, he means it like... He princess, like, he means it like a dick. I mean, he yes, he does, but also you can see that there's there's almost this like junior highness to yes. their relationship, like maybe even before junior high, like maybe like when you're middle like school. well, I mean, That's middle school and junior high the same thing. But no, they're not. They yeah, definitely they are. are. Oh, fuck, fuck <laughs> I'm gonna fight. Go ahead. Uh, but the like you see this like contention, like almost like kids do, where like when they like each other, like uh, and then they like antagonize each other or like tease each other or act weird around each other but you can tell it's because they like each other like, pull her pigtails and knock her down yeah kind of thing right, that exactly also supports like Susie the and thought. calvin they're like Susie and calvin but that also support i don't like the whole if a guy's teasing you Ooh, it's because he likes you reference. because that also creates this narrative for women where if a man's mean to you it's because they like you so you should fuck with it which is why I say, like, undeveloped, like, childhood as relationship. Like, should that be retaught? Of course. I Do you think there's a direct correlation between this relationship and this movie and then men thinking that negging is a good pickup artist tactic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to let Anthony handle that one. I don't think this film does it any favors. I'm not going to go so far as to say <laughs> that this movie is responsible for teaching men that nagging is acceptable, but it certainly is. It's it's a good example. Good meaning. Yeah. I'll, I'll rephrase it. It's a clear example of nagging, but I won't say that necessarily guys are watching this going, oh, well, Han is calling Leia your worshipfulness and this and that, and he's busting her balls and everything, and, and, and she says, okay, I love you and everything, so this is how I get girls i mean i'm sure maybe somewhere there's a guy out there who thinks that that's the way to do it i bet you there's a lot of guys him. who think han solo is the way the truth and the light in terms of like how to be with women to get women 
I will say that in my single days, I did use the, okay. with a girl that I knew was a big Star Wars fan, so this is a caveat, that I did use the, um, I, you know, I, I'm i a scoundrel, whatever, and she, she said to me at one point, she said, I, I happen to like nice men, and I said, I can be I mean, nice, and I leaned in move. for a that's kiss. That's a cute move. She I'm thought that was pretty funny and well move. played on my part. But I think everything leading up to that, though, like, I would be like, you're not a nice man. And then I'd shove him if it was, like, everything that led up with those two. Right. But I think that moment is where he changed, you know? Like, that's where he's – he was vulnerable there. Like, even though it was only partially because he's still kind of gaming the situation. Like, Han is always gaming a situation. <clears throat> that's part of his character. He's a, he's the rogue. He's always going to be gaming something. But for him to, like, let his armor down a little bit in that moment to, like, start – actually showing her him and like being nice to her oh what a peach what a ch- what how nice that he's finally gonna be nice to her no i'm you know like <laughs> he's being he's a han's selfish like that's his whole character is he's selfish mm-hmm. and for him to like start letting it's, it shows a moment of growth and like why their relationship starts to blossom a little bit even though i think what the butthurt fanboys from the current trilogy can't seem to understand is that like watching this relationship and to understand that it never quite blossomed into what it needed to be for a healthy marriage to exist. Exactly. Uh, you know, like it, it, the markers are clear here that this was not going to develop unless something changed drastically. And they didn't because Han always kept himself in mind first and did what he needed to do for him rather than like commit into the relationship. So like, despite that, everybody loves that improvised Harrison Ford I know moment. I don't think that I would say as a therapist that this would be a direction I would recommend anyone to look in for how to model a healthy relationship. What do you think, Anthony? <laughs> I feel like you're looking so like serious. I, we can see each other via Skype. Well, listen. Uh, <laughs> well, well, no, it's, it's a situation where I'm, I'm listening to it and it's, uh, I'm not coming at it from necessarily the perspective of, of a therapist. I am coming at it from the perspective of a guy who has learned a lot about himself and, and relationships. And I've been married now two and a half years. And I mentioned I just have a kid. I just had a kid. so And I have a young son. And I'm going to do my level best to teach him that those sorts of things mm-hmm. that were acceptable quote unquote when i was younger in terms of how to treat girls and the the teasing and so on and so forth that that's not yeah. okay i mean there's there's one thing to have a back and forth relationship my wife and i can certainly go back and forth with the best of them but the notion of oh you you teach her that you care about her by being mean to her that's not that's not acceptable and and i'm going to do my best as a, a father to instill that upon him so that we can continue to evolve and so that he doesn't end up like the Han Solo in the beginning of the movie, that hopefully he ends up more like the Han that we see in Force Awakens and Last Jedi, where he's he's a little more open and, and honest. Even yeah. then, he's still a little guarded, but I think that's who Han is. But in terms of the relationship, I think that it, there's, a, there's a nice evolutionary arc over the, the films as we get to the later parts of the, of the story. Especially in at the end of Return of the Jedi, Han has definitely shown like a very big change from this like being an aggressive asshole and like, guarded all the time to being much more open to her and accepting and like treating her more like a partner. And I guess absolutely. And I feel like I'm coming at this less from a therapist and more as a single woman who is dating has dated for a while now, and I think in more watching it made me. Th- reminiscent of all of the interactions I've had with men where it's this like fuck boy cool guy mentality I mean as a therapist it's definitely not a great relationship but it was more like oh it made me think of all the times that guys have tried to pull that shiz with me and I'm like this is feels bad and I think what I feel like is I mean I I'm a teaser Ben and Hannah both know this I tease a lot but I feel like what feels different with those two is it doesn't feel like teasing it feels like they're testing each other in this very mean way all the time like, what are you going to do if I say this? And what are you going to do if I say that? And are you finally going to say that you like me because I'm, like, yelling at you about what, that I'm leaving? You know what I mean? It's, it feels like a lot of, like, all these series of tests to try to get the other one to, like, it's like chicken. It's like vulnerability chicken. They're trying to get the other one to finally break first and be like, I, I don't want you to leave because I like you. 
But they won't do that because they're both emotionally 10 year olds. And I agree that I think watching this relationship in this movie and knowing that they can't keep their shit together when they get married makes a lot of sense. I don't I don't feel like Han has changed that much. I think in Force Awakens, he's so vulnerable with Ben, with Kylo Ren in that moment. But it probably too little too late. Yeah, exactly. Which is the problem. Yeah. So I think probably losing Ben really made him grow. And, like, his moments with Leia are a lot tenderer Mm -hmm. when they see each other, which is also just the age. They're all, they're much older now. That's true. And have a lot more perspective, like, retrospective. And so, but it's, like, it's a, but it's a shame that it had to take a huge, huge, huge trauma and everything falling apart for them to get there, which is unfortunately how it can happen when you refuse to be vulnerable and to be open and you come from a guarded place all the time is if you have all those walls up, the only way they come down is when something horrible smashes through them. Absolutely. Well, I think that's human nature in general is we don't really change unless there's some major intervening event and i'm sure uh, uh, you don't need to be a therapist yeah. to figure that shit out that's just general human nature but that we don't tend to grow unless there's a major impetus and unfortunately for han and leia it was the whole situation with ben but i think we're we're digressing a little bit from from empire <laughs> per se if you want to know more about the last jedi you could certainly listen to the the popcorn psychology episode on the last jedi which is what started this whole entire show but mm-hmm. agreed that's a plug for oh, you guys. You. Which, uh, <laughs> side note, we uh, just tweeted that at Mark Hamill, who sent us <laughs> two likes yesterday on the tweet about our episode on The Last Jedi started by kind of his performance. And then when we sent him a thank you for liking our post, he liked that too. So we had a bit of a, a geek out moment on our uh, May the 4th moment. <laughs> oh, Mark Hamill's yeah, fun. Yeah. Agreed. He's very he uh, interactive. Uh, I guess what I would throw to Ben and Anthony as the lovers of this movie, what do you guys see in Han and Lo- Leia that feels admirable relationship-wise? Or that, that feels positive or that makes you root for them? Wow, the silence is oh, deafening. Oh, man. Ben, you want to start? <laughs> this, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, Anthony, right now I am hearing three words in my head right now that make me feel very unsafe. I'm and they're, it's anything. a trap. <laughs> I asked you this question because I honestly want to know we don't what do, you guys see. We don't do testing like Han and Leia. <laughs> We're or, asking or you Yoda. because we appreciate your view and we want to know this relationship seems like shit. What makes you what makes you hopeful for them to like after this movie ends because when this movie ended for me i was like i'm sad that they are end up together yeah in some ways and that's only in the context of this okay movie. I'll, I'll take mm-hmm. i'll take the bait okay i'll take i'll take the bait to start i think the thing that uh, that i appreciate about the relationship is the fact that you have this incredibly strong-willed determined powerful woman leia and Han, who is the scoundrel and the rogue, the lovable rogue mindset, is not intimidated by her, but he's intrigued. And I think it's a situation where she makes him better by their relationship. Not that she's perfect by herself and not that he is, you know, completely without redeeming qualities, but that she makes him better by being herself and that she brings that sacrifice out in him and by the time that he's saying goodbye to her before right before he's going in in uh, you know frozen in carbonite that he realizes that he needed to make i mean he was certainly being captured but he was willing to make that sacrifice for everybody else and i think uh again just just by virtue of that interaction the and as i'm saying this the only thing that I would say I would change a little bit differently is when he tells Chewie to look after Leia. I don't think Leia necessarily needed anybody to look after her. I think that was just more of a, Hey, you know, you're, you're my best friend. Just make, just check in on her or whatever. So I, I would have maybe tweaked the wording on that a little bit as I'm, as I'm saying it out loud now, (laughs) it's occurring to me, but I think that's what, that's what 
appeals to me that he has this very strong willed independent woman and he doesn't back down that he says, OK, I, I may he may go about it in a in a way that may rankle some people, cough, cough, Brittany and Hannah. But I think ultimately he comes out of it a better person because of that. And that's what I admire about the relationship. I'll build on that. I think that Anthony's points are spot on here. I think what I like to see about it is that you see a growth and that they both have to grow into each other and let their guard down because just as we're kind of attacking Han for being so guarded, Leia is super guarded herself. No, they both suck. They're both guarded. Yeah, agreed. Like, Leia is so guarded and so, like, wrapped into her mission and her thing that she's not willing to let anybody in, but they built up this relationship that it's been clear the whole time between the two of them since A New Hope that even though they both, like, love to hate each other, they love to hate each other. And to see them realize that their relationship could be more if they stopped being children and attacking each other and oh, actually let their guards down and open each other up that they could bring out the best versions of themselves, which is the, you know, the cinematic dream. But like, as a therapist, it just makes me nervous because the thing we always want to make people know is that you can't change someone and movies and stories show us all over the place that you can if you just love them enough if you're just good enough and you can get them to change and both people have to grow and change together and bring out the best versions of themselves for that to happen realistically but it's it's there's something rewarding about seeing these two characters like learn to grow together even though they get it taken away from them as soon as they open up mm-hmm. okay well said. All right, so let's. Uh, I think we've covered Han and Leia so much. Let's talk a little bit about the smooth operator, Lando Calrissian. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello there, ladies. All right, so I think La- what makes Lando an interesting character is that Lando is put in an impossible situation. He has Darth Vader and Boba Fett that have shown up before his best friend in the world comes back to talk to him. And even though they've had a difficult history, he has to show Han into the trap. And he has to do that by being welcoming and friendly, even though he's knowingly leading his best friend into a trap. But he's in the situation where he's now the administrator of this entire city where everyone's life is at stake from the threat of the Empire, and he has to sacrifice his friend to keep everyone safe. And I don't feel like a lot of people have processed really that predicament that he's in, at least not right away. Like, like, oh, Lando's kind of a douche. And then you, like, realize the position he's in. So I think that kind of talking about like, the choices he has to make and how impossible that is, is giving that some space is an important aspect of our discussion here. <laughs> I mean... I don't really have anything to say about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I get what you're saying. Um, like, I mean, what could he do? I mean, also, is it also endangering the lives of all the people that work under him? Like, it was kind of like a pros and cons situation of, like, value of life. And do we value one person's life who's my friend more than, like, all these other people that trust me as their leader? You know? I definitely get it. And he clearly... He clearly looks like he is upset, is frustrated, and scared, and is kind of. I mean, like he appears to be very friendly, but in the moments where he doesn't have to pretend anymore, he clearly is scared and upset and is worried. I mean, like I definitely think that is a really stressful situation for him, and I think even watching it um, this time, it was easy to see that this wasn't a decision that he was just like being a dick to like be a dick or to like to get some money or get some exchange from the empire. Like he was doing this out of fear because he didn't have another choice. Mm -hmm. And he clearly felt like he was betraying his friend. I think it was all over his face. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a, it's, it's a really rough spot for, for Lando to be in. And, uh, you know, as you, as you said, he has to balance the lives of, of his best friend, and Chewie and Leia, who he's very also clearly attracted to versus literally everybody else. I mean, he, he wasn't going to sacrifice war Hood. 
I mean, you know how important Will Rohut is? You know how important that ice cream maker is? <laughs> I mean, he has to carry an ice cream maker through Cloud City, Anthony. It's Absolutely. Very that important. ice cream maker is responsible for feeding the ice cream to every other person working in Bespin. You know, you know how hot it gets mining Tabana gas day in and day out? You need that ice cream. Will Rowe Hood is a goddamn hero. I mean, you definitely need that. Hannah and Brittany are so lost right now. <laughs> I feel okay about it. All right, so, <laughs> Anthony, I don't know if even you know this, but uh, at, at Celebration every year, at Star Wars Celebration, the big con, they have a running of the Will Rowe Hoods where everybody uh, who decides to participate in this gets an ice cream maker and puts on the full costume with the mustache and everything of Will Rowe Hood and goes like tearing ass running through the entire convention center that carrying an ice cream maker absolutely amazing and i need to go to celebration one of these years just so i can participate i will not wear blackface but i will participate in the running of the willrow hoods yeah definitely no one wears blackface they definitely don't do that um but i have to yeah. give a shout out to one of my uh garrison mates actually two of them so uh tj and his uh partner anna they uh anna and tj participated in the running of willrow hood but uh tj dressed up as Wilro and Anna flipped it. She dressed up as the ice cream machine and carried a Wilro hood doll that another <laughs> uh, one of our garrison mates, Kathy made. Oh, that's pretty. That's dope. amazing. That's and really and I think she made it onto star Wars.com with that. So for those of you that aren't familiar, like there's the scene of this character is just like taking off running through <laughs> cloud city, carrying an ice cream machine. And uh, it's just, I mean, it's it feels very Lando Calrissian ish. <laughs> But that would be like his priority. I mean, he wears capes but, for no reason. But in all so seriousness, it. it's, it's important for him to take care of his people. Um, you know, not just not just Han. I think there's a small part of it is that the selfish, self-serving bit. But to to a larger degree, he's he's grown and changed a lot from the character that we see retroactively in Solo. That he has all this responsibility, and I'm very curious to see where he's going to go in Rise of Skywalker because yeah. we already know that obviously Billy D uh, returns as Lando in Episode Nine. Um, I'm so, so I'd be very curious to see what they do with him. Yeah, I'm so excited to see what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited too. I think that like the just like looking at Lando and realizing how much trauma is in all these characters, but of. Of all of them, honestly, I think Lando is put in the worst position. Like of all the characters, I think that like the theme of this movie is much like the Last Jedi: is what is the hardest thing each character can face. And Lando, I think, has the worst deal because he is put in between. He's also got to, you know, he doesn't know Luke, but he's going to help spring this trap for him. But he has to sacrifice his friend, his friend's girl, his you know, like other friend Chewie, and he has to do it with a smile in order to save everyone he loves and everything he's built and everyone he's responsible for. And I just think, like, people don't recognize that the biggest hero turn in this whole movie that happens is done by Lando, recognizing that Vader's villainy is so extreme that he's going to keep making the deal worse all the time, that Lando finally has to take a stand and put himself and everything at risk to stop this. Even though he fails. Fair point. Mm -hmm. But he makes a huge hero turn. Lando, I think Lando takes the, the biggest hero turn in the whole thing. Well, to be fair, that that's not that difficult only because he's he's not up against a lot of competition. Everybody else we've already established as a hero or a villain. So in terms of the biggest hero turn in this movie, what does he have to compare to? Yoda, who starts off as a troll and then reveals himself to be the Jedi Master. That's true. And that's, true. that's it. I mean, aside from the the bounty hunters, I mean, unless you were going to have like IG-88 turn and reveal himself to suddenly be one of the good, or Bosk is actually like a double agent working for the, the rebellion. I, well, what about Zuckus and Forlom? Fuck those guys. <laughs> I'll explain all this later to you too. All I'm right, okay. so, I think I'm, I'm okay. Good. I think I'm good. <laughs> we didn't even talk about Dengar, guys. <laughs> Diaper head. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> What about Ooh, Lobot? Lobot? All right, so let's move on to talk about Lobot's Luke just and following Vader. orders. I mean, this is this is a kind of cinema moment when you know anybody thinks of Star Wars. There's always the "I am your father" moment, and he's like, "No!" His stupid face. Technically, most people misquote it as "Luke, I am your father" when the actual line is "No, I am your father." Absolutely correct. Everybody misquotes that. That's that's a beam me up, Scotty 
type mm -hmm. misquote. Or a play it again, Sam. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a whole TV trope page on oh. that. Well, I mean, I remember when I was watching it, really wishing I could see Vader's face when he learns that Luke is his son. Or that he has a son. Or those kids made it. And he just, that mask. <laughs> From the Emperor? Yeah. And the way that the Emperor presents it as if he's still not Anakin Skywalker inside that fucking suit. <laughs> like he says, well, he's Anakin Skywalker's son. Yeah, oh, you fucking asshole. It's his <laughs> son. The guy standing in front of you in the suit. But that's probably the manipulation of the whole, like, yeah. the, the Sith and the Jedi do, which is we gotta break down your identity and build you up as someone new. But we still don't know at this point that Vader is Anakin. Oh, so it's just kind of sneaky script writing. Oh, shit. Really? Yeah, really. Oh, so that's that just, why I like, failed. Hannah has the most interesting face ah, on right now. So is that so it's a double so it's a double shock. Like not only am I your dad but Luke Anakin well, Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader. That that's I get that now. <laughs> huh. Oh, you can see how much me and Hannah are so outside of our wheelhouse, we're like losing oxygen in space. <laughs> yeah, to be fair to everyone to like help them understand like uh we haven't released it yet but we did do a live episode on episode three um so we've watched prequels recently so like to uh, experience this movie in the way it was meant to be experienced it, it, we're coming at it a little bit backwards at least for recency for these two so there's a bit yeah. of a recency I feel like bias. i've watched them all out of order <laughs> and the lot <laughs> correct yeah the live episode will be released by the time it's released it you need to do machete order. That's what you need True, to do. But, okay. You know. <laughs> when they're listening to understand. Uh, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about this relationship with Luke and Vader. Like, we see, this is an absolute representation of manipulation, which is always what we see with the villains in Star Wars. Is there's always manipulation. There's manipulation on both sides of the Force, honestly. We covered that pretty well with the, the Jedi. But Absolutely. When we look at Vader, how is Vader using this confrontation to manipulate Luke because he knows the whole time a that he can own Luke uh in a fight and also that what he's trying to do the whole time is capture him and turn him not defeat I think Vader could have defeated Luke quite easily absolutely especially after that Rogue One hallway scene I don't think that Luke with no combat experience with a lightsaber could have represented even remotely a challenge to the Anakin. slowest fight I have ever seen <laughs> I just kept going, this is so slow. When I was watching with Hannah, I was like, this is such a slow fight. Like, Darth Vader clearly should be wolfing his ass. Which is, but I get what you're saying. If he was kind of letting him have more of an advantage, I think it makes me wonder with Darth Vader, I mean, is if he is genuinely looking at Luke as an asset, purely in the sense of like, he's going to be really strong. So let's turn him. So he's on our side. Or is it like, He's using that as an excuse because he's still having Anakin feelings up in his business and he wants to like see if he Ooh. can get his son to him. But and I don't even know if he would be honest with himself about it even, where his energy's coming from to keep him one to not really kill him outright and then to try to bring him to his side. Well, let's not forget the Emperor has given him a command and Vader is loyal to the Emperor to above all else. But he, but he gives a suggestion like, but what if I just like, I think I can him. Like he, he's the one who suggests that in the Emperor, the throne room. Right. If, if he could be turned, he'd be a powerful ally. Yeah. So he's yeah. the one who brings it up. So I wonder where his head's at with that. Uh, what well, we know from comics that he's definitely thinking about taking over the galaxy uh, with father and son and like the whole two thing but, yeah. and he has oh, to be yeah. the emperor and have an apprentice and uh, we're just going to forget our killer exists because that was a bunch of nonsense um and you know that vader was thinking that um but he didn't learn that until you know 37 years or so after the movie came out <laughs> that's a problem like, where Brittany's dead, but look at the manipulation that done i think what's important to look at is how they look how did he bay luke into getting into the situation that him in with his friends Han, yeah he kind of just baited him into a fight and then kind of like lulled him into a when Luke fell down that hole I laughed really hard <laughs> <laughs> all it's yeah the fighting was the fighting was hard not to laugh at in, in a lot of different ways but I do think that Vader clearly had 
a very laid out plan for what he was going to do. Like it all felt very, I think when talking about how slow the fight felt, I think that it felt very, uh, what's the word? Orchestrated? Yeah, like he really had thought out everything and all of the moves that he was going to make and that maybe he wasn't going to kill Luke, but he was going to hurt him in some way, like by chopping off his arm or his hand, I mean, to try and make him feel less than and be like, but I can help you with this and I can help you figure this out. Like, look, I'm in this suit. Like, I think that he really, I feel like maybe there was some stuff going on with him subconsciously and that's kind of part of why he wanted to get him. But I also feel like he was so loyal to... Uh, the Emperor. I do think maybe the way he manipulates him, I don't know if this is what you're picking up on, Ben, is that he kind of, he lulls him into a fight, lulls him into a feeling of we're more closer to equals, combatively, but then I chop off your hand and dominate your ass, make you feel very weak and vulnerable in the moment, and then I want to punch you with I am your dad. And so he has him at a very weakened state where he's undercut his ability and then turned his world around to put him in this very vulnerable position where he might just make a decision based on a space of desperation. Which is actually the exact opposite of what Yoda did. Yoda let him, or, well, similar, I guess, because Yoda let him kind of show his true colors first, whereas Vader did not. Vader did not, like, kind of waited and hid and didn't show his full combat ability because he's trying to get Luke to feel confident in his ability to fight so that when he tears him down, it has more of an impact. That he's really crushed him. Mm-hmm. Crushed spirit. Well, not for no- not for nothing, look at the, the Vader versus Obi-Wan fight. <laughs> From from slow. a new hope, you have two. You you neither one of them are at their peak. You've got the you've got the the octogenarian yeah. Jedi Master versus he's more machine <laughs> than man now. So this is not the guy, the same guy who, when they fought in Revenge of the Sith, mm-hmm. they were twirling and force movement this and that. This is this is not a guy who has all of those speed and and skills that he had in his younger days so to some extent i think he was taking it a little easy on luke because he wanted to save him as an asset for to be used but also i don't think that vader was technically capable and that's why once we see luke in return of the jedi again to take it outside of this film when we see luke at the height of his ability he whoops vader's ass because vader physically cannot stand up to someone Mm. with who is physically younger, stronger, has the, the the command of the force. That's why Luke wins that fight as, as handily as he does. It's not until the Emperor steps in that he starts, you know, really doing damage to Luke. And also Luke realizing, holy shit, I'm about to kill my father and I don't want to do that. But that's what it comes down to. So I think that's part of why uh, Vader Vader toys with him a little bit. He said, yeah, I could kill you, but mm-hmm. I'm just going to throw shit at you, knock you around. Mm-hmm. Smack you. I'll, knock, I'll cut your hand off, but that's about it. He didn't want to kill Luke. If he if he, if he did, he could have, but he didn't want to. Right, and, like all that was like, part of like this this very planned emotional takedown that he did to Luke because he let Luke believe that he was a combat equal. He let Luke believe that he had a chance that he could save his friends. It was about anything other than Luke, but he walked right into this trap and then continued to walk into it, bullheaded, thinking that he could use his superior combat ability to everybody else not realizing that he's not really encountered another Jedi or force sensitive other than people on his side before and Vader is continually going through like the process of tearing him down isolating him making him feel alone and then providing himself as the only true path out of that trap that he set which is exactly how people who are going to manipulate and control other people do it. It's a T. They follow the same process every time. They isolate you. They beat you down emotionally. They beat you down physically. They beat the fight out of you and then offer you a path out by doing yeah. exactly what they want. Or they give you a little emotional gem. Like they throw you a little emotional bone. Like, but I'm that. And so they make you feel like, oh, so it throws you off your axis. Fair point. And then I think the, the other thing we need to cover with Luke is how he handled, how would you handle, or how would you see a client handle, like, the worst news ever? Like, what Throw could... myself into that precipice. <laughs> <laughs> let it go. Let it go. <laughs> like, goodbye. <laughs> Just let go. No, I mean, I think... You're fired. I, I think, I think that's... <laughs> I think that for Luke, 
I cannot recall Return of the Jedi or what he is like in that movie, so apologies. But I think... Much more grounded and deliberate. Oh, and I think it would make you... Yeah, it would make you... It really... I think it would almost make you very trepidatious. Like, almost too, like... Because you went in all, like, hot-headed and, like, hot-blooded and I can do it, like, big dick thing. You lose your hands which is a big part of, like, where you're trying to gain, a, like, autonomy through fighting. And then, um, but he just get that brand new making hand immediately, so I guess it doesn't really, but, um, mm-hmm. and I think it would definitely make me doubt myself a lot and maybe have a really hard time making choices and feeling like I deserve to be in charge of choices. It really, I don't know, I may, it really crippled me emotionally or, like, confidence-wise. I think when we find out something that messes with our identity of who we thought we were, or where we thought we came from, that it changes who we think we are and who we thought we were. So I think that you're right. I think that it would have a really big emotional change. I think it, because you just don't trust yourself. Because like, well, I thought that I knew this about myself and how could I come? And in his story, how could he come from something this horrible? Yeah. Because he also, I don't think... No. Does he know about his mom? Does he know very much about his mother? No. 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 So he doesn't know that he was ever loved by the people who had him. And I think it's also like you're saying that thing of when you have a really horrible parent and how do you not feel like there's something really bad inside of me because I come from them? Yeah, a little bit. But I also think it just in regards to Luke specifically, like, I mean, being the son of the worst guy Mm -hmm. in the galaxy is pretty heavy news, just in general. So, like, having that idea of how can that be true and also who's lied to me, who has been lying to me all this time. Yeah, because Luke's identity is really hung up on my dad was a big deal Jedi. He was, like, such a good Jedi and I'm going to follow in his footsteps and that's all been taken from him. And that sometimes when the when the parts of us that we really thought to be true are changed or when the people that we thought really loved us maybe didn't love us or at least weren't honest with us, it really changes the way that you feel about yourself, the way that you feel about the world. Sometimes the world doesn't feel safe anymore. I mean, in some ways, even though I know I've been talking smack about Luke the whole time, in some ways his response is pretty good like he has he he seems to be able to kind of manage it a little bit i mean i know that he feels but automatically he goes to the person that he thinks should have told him yeah right ben like why didn't why didn't he tell me why there's so many people in my life who could have told me the truth and nobody told me even yeah. yoda well i mean it's like he's, doesn't he's like an uncle too like especially since now they're deceased i think it would be really hard to find peace with that yeah if we're not to change how he feels about them because he can't even like confront them about it and like talk it through. And does anybody else have any thoughts, Anthony? Anything you want to chime in with Luke and Vader? No, I think I I said my piece uh, earlier, and I think you guys pretty much covered everything that that I would have or could have thought of. <laughs> All right. So as far as any treatment, who would you target for treatment out of these characters? Uh, Luke, I guess. I think he's very young, and so I think I'd probably treat him like an adolescent client, um, and just kind of probably just do like existential work with him, especially after this Vader business, dad business, like and losing his hand too. Even though he has like a nice spanking new like robot hand, um, kind of say like, how is this information sitting with him? How who does he think he is now? Like, what are his? Has it impacted his goals? Um, what he thinks he can be, you know what I mean? What he wants to be. And is it, if it was wrapped up already in the identity of being like his dad and now that's gone, how much of what he was truly doing was something he would have done anyway. And maybe helping empowering him to, to be confident in the choices he made outside of it, just being like, I was falling in my dad's footsteps. I think I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that doing existential work with Luke is going to be huge. Uh, you would also probably want to work on CBT with him because now whatever core beliefs he had about himself and about the world just got shattered. So you would have to work with him on how to combat the negative thoughts that are going to arise in his mind about what that means for him and probably work on actually sitting and writing out 
the counter evidence to those negative thoughts because despite that like, now he's learned that Vader is his father, he is not Vader. But for him to adopt that like, existential identity of like, no, what what does that mean for me? What does that mean? My destiny is my father was this huge like hero and then he did, became the worst person in the galaxy. And how have the anger steps I've made? I didn't listen to Yoda. I didn't do this. I've taken steps out of anger and actions out of anger and recognizing that these things in myself could lead me down this path. How do you work with him on challenging any of the negative thoughts and behaviors that might fuel him into the direction he's the most afraid of? Because I imagine that not only is he going to have trauma, which we see in The Last Jedi clearly, uh, that Luke has had a life full of trauma, but the anxiety that's going to come from this and how to learn to deal with that because part of what drives Luke is anxiety and fear and he would need to learn how to counter those and which he does but to be more mindful of how do things fit into the bigger picture much like Anthony is saying versus what do I see and deal with right now because if he continues to see or to deal with only what he sees right now and what he locks onto as a future that could be not paying attention to always in motion the future is from Yoda is that he's going to continue to make bad decisions and be vulnerable to the dark side as opposed to learning to become a grounded person who can make challenging decisions and make things happen in a way that makes sense for the whole universe, not just for his reality. I don't know who I would do treatment with. <laughs> well, I think I didn't bring up Han and Leia because I thought maybe I mean, I you'd think, do couples yeah, work with them. Yeah, I was thinking them. about Han and Leia and doing, and doing couples work with them because I do think that it would be really interesting like if we could do something where like I did treatment with them and then maybe they wouldn't have the reaction that they had to Ben, their son. Mm-hmm. And how interesting that would be. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But I think that I would... <laughs> Because it's clear that at the by the end of the movie or whatever that they have at least been a little bit vulnerable with each other, and that I would I would when they come in, I would definitely just teach them communication skills, and and practicing being vulnerable with each other and practicing being open with each other because I do think that that is where their strength is and that that is what they need and that is also what they need most to learn. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, uh, based on the things that I saw in this movie, I would say that there definitely would be have a better chance of ending up in a situation where there's a lot of resentment, a lot of hurt. There's so much that's unsaid. Exactly. And maybe like end up stonewalling each other where they just don't even talk to each other at all because they have so many hurt feelings that they're not allowed to talk about because they're not allowed to be vulnerable with each other. And so I think that would be the most important thing that I would want to help show them. And I think that this early in their relationship and also with how young they are emotionally, I think that it would be, I think that it probably would go really well. Yeah. Because sometimes the difference between getting Han and Leia in The Empire Strikes Back and getting them The Force Awakens or The Last Jedi is... I can't remember when he dies. So. Force Awakens. Force, Force Whatever. Awakens. So he yeah. dies in The Force. So, so getting them in The Force Awakens, I feel like their prognosis for treatment would be very poor. Yeah. And I might even, when I do their individual assessment, decide that they are not fit for couples therapy. But... The Han and Leia that are in the, in the Empire Strikes Back, I could help them. Mm-hmm. I could help them be more connected to each other and help them before they start this relationship off with a lot of hurt and a lot of negativity and a lot of just really hurting each other, even in little in in little ways, and not ever really having a space where they can apologize for that either. Yeah. So that's what that's it. for right now. I think that Han and Leia are probably the best example that I can get. I've been thinking of all these like weird family situations where I could get like Luke and Vader and Leia in the room. What that would be like, but we can't. So that's a lot. <laughs> so for right now, just Han and Leia. I think. Oh, and Leia doesn't even know yet. Exactly. So it's a, there's impossible. So. Well, I was going to say, speaking as as the non therapist and sort of taking the non-traditional method or the non-traditional look at things, I would suggest Leia for, for therapy, not, not trying to necessarily go for the hot take, but largely based on not only the issues with Han, but also 
some of that lingering, mm -hmm. have, wanting her to address her relationship with Luke, whatever it is. Obviously, they don't know that they're siblings yet, but she's she's got this relationship with Han that starts off. But yet in the beginning of the movie, she's very willing to kiss Luke to, to prove the point. She does have some feelings for him. She feels that connection with him. How does she parse through all of that? And how does she learn to communicate better? Because she grew up as a princess. She grew up as the the respected person. And, and that's all well and good. Mm -hmm. But that also comes with occasionally its own set of problems where you don't feel that you can be vulnerable and you don't feel yeah. that you can communicate because it will be perceived as weakness because you have to be the leader, because you have to be strong for everyone. And so you don't have the opportunity to, to let let yourself go and to be free to express who you are. So I would say, again, you know, my pick just again, not as the therapist, but just trying to, to think outside the box a little bit. I would want to talk to Leia and get her take on this whole thing, because even so much of what happens in return of the Jedi and the little tiff that she has with Han is because she can't quite yeah. parse out her feelings for Luke and she can't, she can't communicate to Han, well, he's my brother. So that's that's what it's about. So I think that she needs to learn how to communicate better, particularly as a leader and as someone who's looked to to be respected and so on. That she needs to learn how to better communicate a little uh, a little more effectively. So that's my just my two cents. I mean, I think that's really that's really insightful, Anthony. I think for Leah especially because she's such a young woman trying to figure out how to be a leader. And but still also being yourself, and I think sometimes, especially for women, especially when you're a young woman, sometimes you try on aspects of masculinity or perceived masculinity to be respected by the males around you. So it's like, and sometimes that can take a real sharp turn, and so you can be a little maybe too tough or too mean or too guarded because you think you have to be that way to combat being feminine. So I think that would she probably is struggling a lot more internally than even we see. So I think that's a good take. I definitely agree. I think that's a huge take. And I think that with Leia, if we were to look at her, the only other thing that she needs is, like, there is almost certainly still the concept of loss that I don't think she ever dealt with and how that fits into her picture because she lost everything. Yeah. Her whole planet in front of her. And I think that, you know, like, Anthony, your take on her is, is just spot on and... You know, maybe you're not a therapist, but you probably could be. You've picked some stuff up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hanging with Doc Issues for over a year and obviously being best friends with them for over 20, I, I do learn some things, if if not through osmosis, then I don't know what. But And that's why when, when mm -hmm. you were talking earlier and I've said, you know, you have to meet people who where they are, I learned that from Doc on, on my show. Every every mm -hmm. episode for me is a little mini therapy session. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's helpful for me to learn things. For sure. And for the, those of you that don't know, that's uh, Anthony's statement there kind of has a double meaning because Anthony is uh, also an actor, and uh, him and Doc have a skit at the end of every show where they kind of take on characters and they go through like an actual session as the characters. So Anthony uh, gets to experience that as both Anthony and the character at the same time, which is kind of <laughs> awesome. You guys got to check out their show for sure. True, true. Thank you very much. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> of course. All right, so I think we've reached a point where we could hit final thoughts. Uh, who wants to go first? Hannah d does not know. want to go first. It's like, should I go? I feel like, should I go first so that we can end on a, maybe a more positive note? Yes. Okay, because here's what, here's what, here's, 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 here's where I'm from, guys. I want, I want to be very sensitive to you, Ben, and to Anthony, and to all the people movies that people don't like, and how it can, even though it has nothing to do with me, can kind of, like, feel hurtful. <laughs> like, I know the Heathers one, I was very defensive. Um, I just found this movie, I guess boring would be the adjective I'd use. And I, and I, but I wish I didn't. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't go into it wanting to, like, rag on it, or rag on you, or anything. Like, it just felt like a lot of, like, going from place to place in like a lot of traveling to somewhere else. And then once they got to that place, not that much would happen. And then they'd be traveling somewhere else. Like, I really thought the stuff with Yoda would be longer. And even like the, them being at Lando's would be longer. Like it felt like a lot of like transitional scenes and not a lot of like meat. And also I just found Luke very unlikable. I found Han and Leia very unlikable. And I think I was surprised by how much I didn't like it. 
And I hate that. I hate, but I hate it though. Cause I want to like it like you like it and like Anthony likes it and like other people like it. And it's not a shade on you guys. I mean, talking about it today has lent some depth to it that I think has helped me like it more for sure. It just didn't give me the zhuzh I thought it would give me watching it, especially since I didn't really remember it. So I was like going into it almost brand new and I was like really excited to like be pumped up by it. And it just, I didn't get there. I didn't get there. And I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ben, but I could, I didn't get there. <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you. <laughs> Halfway. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. You're dead to me. I res- I respect that, that hot sweet. take though. I respect that hot take. <laughs> I feel like that's fair. <laughs> um I also fuck man. I Me and Hannah watched it together and we were genuinely perplexed by how unpumped up we are. We kept looking at each other and being like, I don't know if I like it. But it was like we were confessing it to each other. We felt very bad. Yeah. I felt <laughs> And just a little bit confused. Imperial troops have entered the base. Well, I'm just like very confused about why. I feel like me and Hannah are trying to be so sensitive. Like the way it. we're talking okay. about this, so, so sensitive. The nicest thing that I can say currently at this moment in time is that it felt very much like a second movie, like when the we middle have, movie, when we, uh, like a middle movie, like in in the movies where there's three of them it felt very much like the second movie just like how lord of the rings like that movie is just them traveling i mean that movie is literally just them traveling all one. over and like fighting each other and stuff the and first one the is second one is helm's deep man just i haven't okay. seen it so i, I have yeah no Brittany also hasn't seen it which, <laughs> is whole, which is a whole other problem you're fired again <laughs> i've seen the first and the third i've seen no, the first no and the you're, you're confused you're confusing that with the hobbit the hobbit is traveling and nothing fucking happens yeah, okay. the hobbit i only watched the first one because that was anyway. meandering as hell so anyway, so yes, um, so I was bummed that I wasn't more excited about it. I didn't really like anybody, probably besides maybe Lando, because he is smooth as fuck. And I love capes. I fucking love capes. Um, <laughs> 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 On the couch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Buzzing. Um, so I probably won't ever watch it again. You've said that about every movie we have ever I done. I have not. I have not. Except the movie got critically destroyed. I will say this about Hannah. Either she loves something and watches it every day for the rest of her life, or she hates it and will never watch it again. Like, Hannah doesn't really... Hannah only deals in absolutes. (laughs) Probably not. Slytherin. (laughs) Probably not great for me. Uh... But Only yeah, a Sith I deals just, in absolutes. I know, right? Ugh. I'm so proud of myself for throwing that quote out. Do I remember who said it and who it's about? No. Obi-Wan. <laughs> Obi-Wan. Episode three. So yeah, so I'm sad that I didn't like it as much as I, because I remember liking it as a girl, and I remember being excited about it, and I remember... Yeah. I mean, I fucking love Harrison Ford. Oh, my God. I mean, I would watch it again maybe just to stare at him more, but there's other movies that he's... Indiana Jones. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I'm bummed that I didn't like it as much as I as I wanted to because I really... I like Star Wars. I like this idea. But then... So, we watched Empire Strikes Back, and then we watched The Last Jedi, and we were both... <laughs> and then we just looked at each other like... This movie's so much better than this. <laughs> Which I know, I know is, is... Controversial, controversial, controversial. Don't of... send us hate mail. Or do, I don't care. I'm sorry. I'm we want, we want to be it. with... We want to be where you are, Ben and yes. Anthony. I want to be with you. But I'm on the other side of the, the, the river and I'm like, I can't get to you. I There's can't... nothing I can do to get over to the other side. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Anthony, you want to okay, st- I'm sorry. Okay, do you want I'm to start done. the love fest? Do you want to start the love fest? Because I feel like we need to we need to get this uh, kind of going in the right direction here. Yeah, I'll 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 let you, I'll let you go go last, Ben, since it is your show. Um, so I will just say that um, forget about everything that they said, <laughs> that Hannah and Brittany said. Uh, not intending to make this bit take, but damn it, if it didn't make me feel good. <laughs> that this is an amazing film. This takes the characters that we experience for the first time in, in a new hope and it puts them through the emotional ringer and what comes out on the other side, I think are certainly more developed characters, more realistic characters, more concrete characters. And at the end of it, I personally feel that I 
am very intrigued to see what happens to them next, where they go from this, because this movie uh, raises just as many questions as it answers, if not more so. And I think that's the mark of a good second film. And the the set design is amazing. And the, the music is literally, it's my favorite film score of all time. John Williams is a goddamn genius. He Agreed. Is. And Absolutely. And everything in this movie is is fantastic. And I was holding my one month old son and we were watching this yesterday on Blu-ray. And he was obviously he's a, a month old and he's barely able to make out my face, much less the TV. But this film has just at least for me so many positive memories and and I, I can't wait to show him. So I, I love this movie. And when we were talking about which one of the episodes that I would guest on and, and you, you sent me the master list. And as soon as I saw empire strikes back on, I said, I'm doing this one. I will, I will fight. I will cut a bitch to get on this episode. I don't you care. I will. You responded. I will so shank fast. people. I didn't even know how you read the whole list. I was like, I was like, oh. I didn't have, I, I didn't read the whole list. Literally. I saw empire strikes back and I stopped. I said, I don't need to watch anything else. The only film that would have made me give pause is if you were doing the Godfather part two. That's the only mm-hmm. other film that would have made me go, hmm, do I want to be on Empire or do I want to be on Godfather 2? Porque no los dos. But, but this, as soon as I saw that on the list, I said, I am doing Empire Strikes Back because I have seen this film. Even, even including Ben amongst the three of you, I would still say I've seen this movie more than the three of you combined. And that includes Ben. That's how much I love this film, and that's a bold that's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. But I stand by my statement. I stand by my by my word on that. So uh, I love this movie, and if you are any sort of a Star Wars fan in any stripe, you love this movie. So you may not you may have it up there with with a New Hope, but you love this movie. You cannot call yourself a Star Wars fan if you don't love Empire Strikes Back, and that's what I'll end with. <laughs> I have to agree with you on that statement, Anthony. I would say that Empire is not my favorite Star Wars movie. A New Hope is. So maybe I've seen A New Hope more times than this one. So you might have me there, but I doubt you have me on A New Hope. I'm like Ted Mosby. I watch it when I'm sick. I watch it when I'm sad. I watch it when I'm happy. But, man, do I love this movie. Um, This movie is... It hits every emotional note it needs to. The characters go from this unrealistic state of like we are able to conquer everything and now we're ready to take on the universe and take on the empire and then the reality of what the empire is hits you and how big it is and how much of a machine it is and the battle of hoth is probably one of my absolute most favorite things ever I don't know yes. what it is about those walkers. I'm wearing my Imperial Walker shirt right now, which is the shirt I wore on the day my daughter was born, and the first picture of her is against the background of my Imperial Walker shirt. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Caroline. Um, <laughs> but the emotional connection to this movie and what you learn from it is incredible. Like You learn, you see these characters go through the hardest things that they could possibly face. Each one of them faces the hardest thing that they could possibly face. Yoda has to face losing another student to go against Vader and the Emperor. Han and Leia lose each other after opening up. Lando has to lose everything he changed his whole life for and change his life again to go from gambler to uh, administrator and now to rebel or rebellion leader eventually. And for him to go through that arc is huge, especially knowing where he comes from. And then for Luke to have to face the reality that he is Vader's son. The last hope in the galaxy, so he thinks and has been taught, is the son of the worst evil. And the only way for him to become a Jedi is to defeat his father. It's a beautiful film and it covers everything. And I have to like, as a therapist, like there's so much philosophy you can learn from this and apply with clients and i think the most impactful thing i've ever learned from this movie is try not do or do not there is no try there is no try because it's true whether you, you don't try and i don't tolerate the word try in my office from clients i never like well i can try like we're, we're not in the business of trying here we're in the business of we're either going to make this decision that we're ready to change or we're not either is okay but you have to commit to one or the other and you know, uh, Hannah and Brittany are 
wrong in this case, and it's okay. I still love you both. It's all right. But maybe we just need to come watch a hundred more times until you fully embrace the beauty of this movie and the soundtrack. And how can you not love the movie that introduced you to the Imperial March? Here's my, here's what I'll say. Everything felt like something I'd already seen before. I think because this movie's so in the zeitgeist, none of those emotional beats that I think should have been there for me were there because I'd already, so many people have done the impersonation of Darth Vader. So I've heard the Imperial March so much, like all the things I've seen the million parodies of and things. So it's like, it didn't feel new to me because I've been exposed to it so much because it is such a beloved movie. And so I think maybe that's part of why it was like, feel flat for me particularly is because it's something I'd already seen so much before. And also so much of the newer movies do play off of like, it was making me think of that the whole time. Like, Oh, this is where this started and this started and this started. And so I think it just, you know, it's like sometimes when you watch a classic movie that's been done, but it's the first one of its kind, but it's been done so many times again, it, it doesn't have the freshness for you that it deserves. Because you've already seen all the imitators. Maybe that's true. I mean, I put myself in my, the mindset because my parents were were kind to me with this. And when they introduced us to Star Wars, they didn't tell us anything. Because oh, you that's know, dope. I, I was born five years after this movie came out. So for me to, you know, like, have that kept secret was, was great because I didn't know. I didn't know. And then the yeah. first time I saw it, you know, like that was soul crushing to me you know like to hear that like what like when you see the videos of parents that have done the same things that mine did for me which is not tell them anything about it and for them you to have that experience organically for you to come at that the way it was intended for that to be an emotional crusher and for that to be like what Mm -hmm. moment that and it just it hits me every time. It's so good. And then I can't wait to do that with imagery with, Thea, with of my son. Vader and Luke fighting and the way they did the lighting and how it was so dark and you just see the sabers lighting up with the yellow lights and in the the way the steam uh, rises. I want to feel how you feel, Ben. I do. I want to feel how you feel right now. Well, I'm looking at Anthony's face right now and I, he he I'm see he feels it. We're in the, we're on the same I'm emotional jealous. connection right now. I'm jealous. Absolutely. I get it. I I am with you 110%. Um it, everything that you are saying is is spot on, and it's 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 so accurate. I know exactly what it is that you're talking about. And like I said, I can't wait to to sit down with Theo when he's old enough and show him that. And I will videotape uh-huh. his reaction as he learns that Vader is Luke's father and all of those things, and and teach him the song. I mean, I remember, I literally remember being three years old, sick in bed, and watching. Uh, Return of the Jedi on VHS. That's one of my my earlier memories. Is sitting not in on the couch. I'm sorry, in the couch in my parents' living room, and I threw up over on myself. And, and because I w- I was deathly ill, and they had to pause the video cassette, and my parents had to give me. They put me in the shower with my clothes still on. That's how messy I was. But these are the things that. But what was I watching? I was watching Return of the Jedi, and it was during the the sp- the seat the. Uh, bike speeder sequence. These are the things that are ingrained in my brain. I will. I don't. Couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast yesterday, but I remember watching Return of the Jedi as a three year old. So it's these kinds of emotional moments. And and to to your point earlier about that you've seen everything that that you've seen all the stuff that it references. Uh, TV tropes. Seinfeld is unfunny. That's exactly what you're describing. It's it's so. It was the the. I guess. The, the header, the the movie that was ahead of its time, but because you're coming at it so many years later yeah. that everything is an homage to it or reference or derivative of that, that when you go back and watch the original, you go, well, yeah. it doesn't. But at the time, it was so fucking perfect. And it is so fucking perfect. And I think on that note, we can just <laughs> let it ride there because there is not a more perfect statement to cover this movie than that right there. I'm going to go play Rogue Squadron now. That's how you were talking about the Battle of Hoth. I'm going to go play Rogue Squadron now on an N64 emulator. Dude, I have an M6, N64 and Rogue Squadron in my living room right now. And maybe I'm going to go do the same I, thing. I, I don't doubt it. Maybe I'll go play Battlefront on my Xbox One instead. Ooh, also good. Also good. Me and Hannah will just drift out of the room. <laughs> you and Anthony can See continue. You guys next time. <laughs> <laughs> can <laughs> All right, everyone. So on that um, note. On that note, um, please be sure to like and review both our show, Popcorn Psychology, and Anthony and Doc's show, Capes on the Couch. 
Both shows are great, and we really are happy to have Anthony as a guest, and we look forward to the next time that we'll do a collaboration, because we really enjoy having you guys, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much, Ben Han and Brittany. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and, uh, you know, please, uh, like I said, uh, you can find our show at capesonthecouch.live. We are on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Capes on the Couch, and uh, please like, rate, subscribe, review, all that good stuff, and be sure to... Uh, follow all of all of our three lovely hosts here on uh, on Popcorn Psychology. Follow them on on the Insta and the Twitter and the social media pages. <laughs> if you find them on Friendster, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, the way we're at... Oh my God, what a deep cut, Friendster. Woo. What's your aim handle? Find us on my aim handle. <laughs> oh, probably had a lot of X's in it for no reason. <laughs> All right, so uh, be sure to find us at popcorn underscore psych on Twitter, at popcorn psychology on Twitter, and popcorn psychology at gmail.com if you have any thoughts, would like to connect with us, any episode suggestions, we're always open to that. Uh, but until next time, thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time.